Chapter 17 The Clouds Burst Next day the trumpets rang early in the camp. Soon a single runner was seen hurrying along the narrow path. At a short distance he stood and hailed them, asking whether Thorin would now listen to another embassy, since new tidings had come to hand and matters were changed. That would be Dane said Thorin when he heard. They will have gotten wind of his coming. I thought they would alter his mood. Bid them come few in numbers and weaponless, and I will hear, he called to the messengers. About midday, the banners of the forest and the lake were seen to be borne forth again. A company twelve was approaching. At the beginning of the narrow way, they laid aside sword and spear and came on towards the gate. Wondering, the dwarves fall among them were both Bard and Elven King, before them of whom an old man wrapped in a cloak and hood bore a strong casket of iron bound wood. Hail, Thorin, said Bard, are you of still the same mind? My mind does not change with the rising and setting of a few suns, answered Thorin. Did you come to ask me idle, idle questions? Still the elf host has not departed as I bade. Till then you come in vain to bargain with me. Is there nothing, then, for which you would yield any of your gold? Nothing that you or your friends have to offer. What of the ark and stone of Thrain? said he. And at the same moment the old man opened the casket and held aloft the jewel. The light leapt from his hand, bright and white in the morning. Then Thorn was stricken dumb with amazement and confusion. No one spoke for a long while. Thorn at length broke the silence, and his voice was sick with thick with wrath. That stone is my father's, and it is mine, he said. Why should I purchase my own? But wonder overcame him, and he added, But how did you overcome how did you come by the heirloom of my house? if there is any need to ask question, uh, such a question of thieves. We are not thieves, said Bard. You own what we will, your own we will give back in return for our own. How came you by it? shouted Thorin in gathering rage. I, I gave it to them, squeaked Bilbo, who was peering over the wall, now in dread, by now in dreadful fright. You, you, cried Thorin, turning upon him and grasping with both his hands. You miserable hobbits, you undersized burglar. He shouted at last for words, and he shook the poor Bilbo like a rabbit. By the beard of Turin. Oh, by the beard of Durin, I wish Gandalf, I had Gandalf here. Curse him for his choice of you. May his beard wither. As for you, I will throw you to the rocks, he cried, and lifted, and lifted Bilbo in his arms. Stay, your wish is granted, said a voice. The old man with the casket threw aside his hood and cloak. Here is Gandalf. And none too soon, it seems. If you don't like my burglar, please don't damage him. Put him down and listen first to what he has to say. You seem all in league, said the Orin, dropping Bilbo on the top of the wall. Never again will I have dealings with any wizards or his friend. And what have you to say, you descendant of rats? <laughs> dear, dear me, dear me, said Bilbo. I am sure that this was all very uncomfortable. You remember saying that I might choose my own fourteenth share? Perhaps I took it too literally. I have been told that the dwarves are sometimes politer in word than in deed. The time was, all the same, when you seemed to think that I had been, been of some service. Descendant of rats, indeed. Is this all a service to you and your family that I have promised, Thorin? Take it that I have disposed of my share as I wished, and let it go at that. I will, said Thorin grimly, and I will let you go at that, and may we never meet again. Then he turned and spoke over the wall. I am betrayed, he said. It was rightly guessed that I could not forbear to redeem the Arkenstone and the treasure of my house. 
For it I will give one fourteenth share of the hoard in silver and gold, setting aside the gems. But that shall be accounted the promised share of this traitor, and with us that reward he shall depart, and you can divide it as you will. He will get little enough, I doubt not. Take him, if you wish him to live, and no friendship of mine goes with him. Get, get now down, get down now to your friends, he said to Bilbo, or I will throw you down. But what, what about the gold and the silver, asked Bilbo. That shall follow after, as can be arranged, said he. Get down. Until then, until then, we get the stone, cried Bard. You are not making a very splendid figure as king under the mountain, said Gandalf. But things may change yet. They may change indeed, said Thorin. And already, so strong was the bewilderment of the treasure upon him, he was pondering whether by the help of Dane he might not recapture the Arkenstone and withhold share of the reward. And so Bilbo was sung, swung down by the, from the wall, which departed with nothing for all his trouble except the armor which Thorin had given him already. More than one of the dwar dwarves in their hearts felt shame and pity in his going. Fellow, farewell, he cried to them. May we w meet again as friends. Be off, cried Thor, called Thorin. You have mail upon you, which is made by my folk, and it is too good for you. I cannot be, it cannot be pierced by arrows, but if you do not hasten, I will sting your miserable feet. So be swift. Not so hasty, said Bard. We will give you until tomorrow. At noon we will return and see if you brought from the hall that, that portion that which is set against the stone. If it is done without deceit, then we will to be depart, and the elf host will go back to the forest. In the meanwhile, farewell. With that, they went back to the camp. But Thorin sent messengers by Rorik, telling of Dane of what had passed, and bidding he come with wary speed. That day passed and night and the night. And the day, next day, the wind shifted west, and the air was dark and gloomy. The morning was still early when a cry was heard in the camp. Runners came in to report that a host of dwarves had appeared round the eastern spur of the mountain, and were now hastening to Dale. Dane had come. He had hurried on on through the night, and so and so had come upon the sooner them sooner than they had expected. Each one of his folk was clad in a hauberk of steel mail that hung to his knees, and his legs were covered in with a hose of fine and flexible metal mesh, the secret of whose making was possessed by Dane's people. The dwarves were exceedingly strong for their height, but most of them were strong even for dwarves. In battle they wielded two-handed mattocks, but each of them also had a short broadsword at his side and a round shield slung on his backs. Their beards were forked and plaited and thrust into their belts. Their caps were of iron and they were, sh they were shod with iron, and their faces were grim. Trumpets called men and elves to arms. Before long, the dwarves could have seen coming could be could have be seen coming up to the valley at a great pace. They halted between the river and the eastern spur, but a few held their way, and crossing the river drew near the camp, and there they laid down their weapons and held up their hands in sight of peace. Bard went out to meet them, and with him went Bilbo. We are sent from the Dane, we are sent from Dane, son of Nain, they said when questioned. We are hastening to our kinsmen in the mountain, since we learn that the kingdom of old is renewed. But who are you that sit in the plains as foes before defended walls? This is, of course, when the polite and rather old-fashioned lane of occasions, then simply, you have no business here. We are going on, so make way, or we shall fight you. They meant to push on between the mountain and the loop of the river, for the narrow land there did not seem to be strongly guarded. Bard, of course, refused to allow the dwarves to go straight to the mountain. He demanded to wait until the gold and silver had been brought out in exchange for the Arkenstone, for he did not believe that this, that would, this would be done, what if once the fortress was manned with, such, with a so large and warlike company. 
They had brought with them a great store of supplies, for dwarves can very carry very heavy burdens, and nearly all of Dane's folk, in spite of the rapid march, bore huge packs on their backs in addition to their weapons. They would stand a siege for weeks, and by that, that time yet more dwarves might come, and yet more, for Thorin had many relatives. And also they would be able to reopen and guard some other gate, so the besiegers would have to encircle the whole mountain, and for that they had not sufficient numbers. These were, in fact, precisely their plans, for the raven messengers had been busy between Thane and, Dorin, and Dane and Thorin. But for the moment that, that, that the way was barred, so after many angry words the dwarf messengers were tired mur muttering in their beards. Bard sent the messengers at went messengers at once to the gate, but they found no gold or payment. Arrows came forth as soon as they were then a shot. They hastened back in dismay. In the camp all were now astir, as if for battle, for the dwarves of Dane were advancing along their eastern bank. Fools laughed Bard, to come thus beneath the mountain's arm. They do not understand war above ground, whether they may have know of battle in the mines. There may be many of our archers now hidden in the rocks along the right flank. Dwarf mail may be good, but they will soon be hard put to it. Let it set on let's let us set on them now from both sides before they are fully rested. But the elven king said, Long will I tarry ere I begin this war for gold. The dwarves cannot pass us unless we will, or do anything for which we cannot mock. Let us hope still for something that will become bring reconciliation. Our advantage in numbers will be enough, and if in the end it must come to uh, even if in the end it must come to unhappy blows. He, but he reckoned without dwarves. But he reckoned without the dwarves. The knowledge of the Arkenstone was in the hands of the besiegers, burned in their thoughts. They also guessed the hesitation of Bard and his friends, and resolved to strike while they debated. Suddenly, without a signal, they sprang silently forward to attack. Bows twang and arrows whistled. Battle was about to be joined. Still more suddenly, a darkness overcame, came on with a dreadful swiftness. A black cloud hurried over the sky. Winter thunder on a wind rot, wild wind rolled up and rumbling in the mountain, and lightning hit its peak. And beneath the thunder another blackness could be seen whirling forward, but did not come within the wind. It came from the north, like a vast cloud of birds, so dense that no light could, could be seen beneath between their wings. Halt! cried Gandalf, who appeared suddenly and stood alone with arms uplifted between the advancing dwarves and the ranks awaiting him. Halt! he cried in a voice like thunder, and his staff blazed forth like a flash like lightning. Dread has come upon you all, alas! It has been more spring more swiftly than I'd guessed. The goblins are upon you. Bolg of the North is coming. O oh, Dane, whose father you slew in Moria, behold, the bats are here above like an army, like a sea of locusts. They ride upon wolves and wargs and uh, are at that are in their train. Amazement and confusion fell upon them all. Even as Gandalf had been speaking, the darkness grew. The dwarves halted and glanced through the sky. The elves cried out in many voices. Come, called Gandalf. There is yet time for counsel. Let Dane, son of Nain, come swiftly to us. So began a battle that none had expected, and it was called the Battle of Five Armies, and it was very terrible. Upon one side were the goblins and wild wolves, and upon the other were elves and men and dwarves. This is how it fell out. Since the fall of the great goblin of the Misty Mountains, the hatred of the race for dwarves had been rekindled to fury. Messengers had passed on to and fro between all their cities, colonies, and strongholds, for they resolved now to win the dominion of the north. Tidings they had gathered in secret ways, and in all the mountains they were forging and, and an arming. Then they marched and gathered by the hills and valley, going ever by the tunnel or under dark, until around and beneath the great mountain Guna, Gundabad of the north, where their capital, a vast host, was assembled, ready to sweep down in time, in time of the storm unawares upon the south. 
Then they learned of the death of Smog, and the joy was in their hearts, and they hastened night after night through the mountains, and came at last until the sudden from the north, hard on the heels of Dane. Not even the ravens knew of their coming, until they came out in the broken lands which divided the lonely mountain from the hills behind. How many Gandalf knew cannot be said, but in but it is plain that he had not expect he had that he had not expected this sudden assault. This is the plan that he had made in council of the elven king and bard, and with Dane, for the dwarf lord was now joined them. Goblins were the foes after all, and their coming of and with at their coming all other quarrels were forgotten. Their only hope was to lure the goblins into the valley between the arms of the mountain, and at themselves to a man in great the and to themselves man the great spurs that stuck struck south and east. Yes, this would be perilous if the goblins were in sufficient numbers to overrun the mountain itself, and so to attack them from behind and above. But there was no time to make any other plans or summon any help. Soon thun the thunder passed, rolling away to the southeast, but the bat cloud came, flying lower, over the shoulder of the mountain and whirled above them, shutting out the light and filling them with dread. To the mountain, cried Bard, to the mountain, let us take our places with it while there is still time. On the southern spur, in its lower slopes and in the rocks of the feet, the elves were set. On the eastern spur were men and dwarves. But Bard and some of the nimblest of men and elves climbed to the height of the eastern shoulder to gain a view in the north. Soon they could see the el the lands before the mountain's feet, black with a hurrying multitude. Ere long, ere long the vanguard swirled round the spurs in and came rushing into Dale. These were the swiftest wolf riders, and already in their cries and hell, he howls rent the air afar. A few brave men str uh, strung them before, before them to make a feint of resistance, and many of them fell before the rest drew back and fled to either side. As Gandalf had hoped, the goblin army had gathered behind the resisted vanguard, and poured now in a rage into the valley, driving up wildly in between the arms of the mountain, seeking for the foe. Their banners were countless, black and red, and they came on like a tide in fury and disorder. It was a terrible battle, the most dreadful of all of Bilbo's experiences, and the one which, at the time, he hated most, which is to say, it was the one where he would be much proud, most proud of, and most fond of recalling long afterwards, although he had been quite right, uh, quite had been quite unimportant in it. Actually, I might say, he had put on his ring early in the business and vanished from sight, if not at all from da from all danger. A magic ring of that sort is not a complete protection from a goblin charge, nor does it stop flying arrows and wild spears, but it does help in getting out of the way. It prevents your head from being specifically chosen for a sweeping stroke by a goblin swordsman. The elves were first to charge. Their hatred for the goblins is cold and bitter. Their spears and swords shone in gloom with a gleam of chill flame. So deadly was the wrath of their hands that held them. As soon as the, ho as the host of their enemies was dense in the valley, they sent against it a shower of arrows, and each flickered as it fled as if with a stinging fire. Behind the arrows, a thousand of their spearmen leapt down and charged. Their yells were deafening. Their rocks were stained black with goblin blood. Just as the goblins were recovering from their onslaught, the elf charge was halted. There rose across the valley a deep-throated roar, with cries of Moria and Dane, Dane. The dwarves of the Iron Hills plunged in, wielding their mattocks, and upon their other side, behind them came the men of the lake with their long swords. Panic came upon the goblins, and even as they turned to meet the new attack, the elves charged again with renewed numbers. Already many of the goblins were flying black down the river to escape from the trap, and many of their own wolves were turning upon them and rending the dead and wounded. Victory seemed at hand when a cry rang out from the heights above. 
Goblins had scaled the mountain from the other side, and were already many and already many were on the slopes above the gate, and others were streaming down recklessly, heedless of those who fell screaming off the cliffs, cliff and precipice, to attack the spurs from above. Each of these could be reached by paths that ran from the ma main mass of the mountain in the center, and the defenders had too few to bar the way for long. Victory now vanished from hope. They had only stemmed the first onslaught of the black tide. Day drew on. The goblins gathered again in the valley. The host of wargs came ravening with them down the bloody guard of Bolg, goblins of huge size and scimitars of steel. Soon actual darkness was coming up into the stormy sky, while still the great bats swirled above about the heads and ears of elves and men, or fastened vampire-like on the stricken. Now Bard was fighting to defend the eastern spur, and yet giving slowly back, and the elf lords were at bay above their king upon the southern arm, then near the watch post on Ravenhill. Suddenly there was a great shout, and from the gate came a trumpet call. They'd forgotten Th Thorin. Part of the wall, moved by levers, fell outward with a crash into the pools. Out leapt the king under the mountain, and his companions followed. Hook and hood and cloak were gone, and they were all shining in armor. Red light leapt from their eyes. In the gloom, the great dwarf gleamed like gold in a dying fire. Rocks were hurled down from on high for the goblins above, but they held on, leapt down to the fall's foot, and rushed forward into battle. Wolf and rider fell or fled before them. Thorin wielded his axe with mighty strokes, and nothing seemed to harm him. To me, to me, elves and men, to me, oh, my kinsfolk, he cried, and his voice shook like a horn in the valley. Down, heedless of order, of order, rushed all the dwarves of Dane to his help. Down, too, came many of the lake men, for Bard could not restrain them, and out upon the other side came many of the spearmen and the elves. Once again, the goblins were stricken in the valley, and they were piled in heaps till Dale was dark and hideous with their corpses. The wargs were scattered, and Thorn drove right against the bodyguard of Bolg, but he did not, could not pierce their ranks. Already behind them, among the goblins like were dead, among the goblins dead, lay many men and many dwarves, and many a fair elf that should have lived yet long ages merrily in the wood. And as the valley widened, his onset grew even slower. His numbers were too few. His flanks were unguarded. Soon the attackers were attacked, and they were forced into a great ring, facing every way, hemmed all about with goblins and wolves, returning the assault. The bodyguard of Bolg came howling up against them, and dove upon their ranks like waves upon a cliff of sand. Their friends could not help them, for the assault from the mountain was renewed with redoubled force, and on either side of them men and elves were slowly being beaten down. On all this Bilbo looked with misery. He had taken a stand on Raven Hill among the elves, partly because it was more chance of escape from this point, and partly, which was the more tookish side of his mind, because if he was going to be in a last desperate stand, he preferred to be on the on the whole to be to, to defend the elven king. Gandalf, too, I might say, was there, and sitting on the ground as if in deep thought, preparing, I supposed, for some last blast of magic before the end. That did not seem too far off. It will not be long now, thought Bilbo, before the goblins win the gate, and we're all slaughtered or driven down and captured. Really, it would be enough to make one weep, after all one has gone through. But rather old Smog had left with had been left with all his wretched treasure, than these vile treachers could get it, and poor old Bomber and B Ballin and Feely and Keely and the rest come to a bad end, in part two, and the lake men and the merry elves. Misery me. I have heard of the songs of many battles, and I've always understood that defeat may be glorious. It seems very uncomfortable, not to say distressing. I wish I was well out of it. The clouds were torn by wind, and a red sunset slashed the west. Seeing the sudden gleam in the gloom, Bilbo looked round. He gave a great cry. He had seen a sight that made his heart leap. 
His dark shapes, small yet majestic against the distant glow. The eagles! The eagles! he shouted. The eagles are coming! Bilbo's eyes were seldom wrong. The elm eagles were coming down the wind, line after line, in such a host that it must have gathered from the eyries of the north. The eagles! The eagles! Bilbo cried, dancing and waving his arms. If the elves could not see him, they could hear him. Soon they took up the cries and echoed across the valley. Many wandering eyes looked up, though as yet nothing could be seen on the except the southern shoulder of the mountain. The eagles, Bilbo cried once more, but at that moment a stone hurling from above smote heavily on his helm, and he fell with a crash and knew no more.